Good morning. How's everybody doing? Three greats, okay. How's everybody doing? Hey, are you glad to be here this morning? Very much so? Yes. Out, outdoors, Sabbath morning, worshiping together. Um, I first want to come out and just say that I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry for any confusion this week with emails that went out. There was a lot of emails we sent out. We were scurrying to put the, 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 uh, the sales up. We were scurrying to, to put everything in order, and there was a little confusion with that, and that we, we had some hiccups with the media. So if you were involved in any of that, and there was confusion, I just want to say I'm sorry, and, and I'm glad you guys are here. And our online audience, um, I'm looking at you guys right now. Welcome to the Aurora Grande Seventh day Adventist Church live stream. We have about a dozen people watching currently. Um, we've had people come in and out. So that's awesome that our reach is going beyond right here, right now. Amen? And so um, this morning, I, I am going to get myself situated here. Um, and uh, so I'm not distracted. Um, you know, the, the passage that I'm going to be talking about this morning is one that rings a bell with many Christians and, and many Seventh-day Adventists because it's one that, that I believe is, is um, super relevant for the generation in which we live. And if you have a Bible, you could turn with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, and I'm going to start with verse 6, which says this, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to all those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Amen? Amen. Then it goes on. There's another angel there. Then a second angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed, saying, anyone who worships the beast or his image, and receives the mark on his hand or his forehead, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. They'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. There'll be no rest day or night for those who receive the mark or worship the image. Then there's the patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, this passage um, we read this morning, we went over this morning, we're going to dive into this morning, has a lot of significance. And so God, um, I pray that we can better understand this this morning. We can better understand who you are and more about your character. And Father, I pray that Jesus is lifted up this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, that was a passage that I actually had to memorize um, I, many years ago when I went to Arise. Um, that, was, that was one of the hundred passages that we had to memorize in the Arise course. Because it's, it's, um, it's very significant um, and relevant for us today. And what I mean by that, well, when you look at Revelation and you look at the prophecies in Revelation and then you connect those prophecies to Daniel, it doesn't take a scientist to, 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 to put the things together, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. You see that there's this message that goes out right before Jesus comes back. And this message is right here in Revelation 14, and we call it the three angels' message. It's a message that the next thing to happen in earth's history, according to Revelation, is what? Okay, good. You're good Bible scholars this morning. Jesus coming back. And I want to say this, because as I was was going over this last night in my notes, I thought to myself, you know, I'll bet you there's people there, including me, that 
especially in the time we're living in, are wondering, well, what does Revelation exactly say, and how do you figure that out? And, and what, here's the thing. If you're interested in studying Revelation, Oscar, could all the elders raise their hands? Just raise your hands nice and high, elders. Look around. If you're interested in studying Revelation, go talk to one of those elders and say, you know, I would be interested in learning more about Bible prophecy and Revelation. I don't know about you, but I think it's amazing that God would, God would lay this out and say, hey, this is for you to see and understand about who I am so that when th- these things happen, guess what? You won't be worried. You won't be stressed. You'll be saying, hey, God's got my back and I know what's going to happen and it's good. Amen? So with that being said, um, there's these three angels' message in Revelation 14, which I believe contains our identity as Seventh-day Adventists more than any other passage in the Bible. You could scour the Bible, and I think this, this, these texts right here that I just, I just repeated, are, 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 we, we hinge our, our, a lot of what we, what we push and believe on, this, on these texts. And so today I'm going to highlight some things, and I hope you're encouraged. I hope that you're filled with faith, and I hope you have a better and clearer understanding of the relevance of this message for you and for me today. Um, proclaiming the everlasting gospel, as, it said, as I said there, is not something new or different, but it's a message of emphasis for planning the good news of salvation. Amen? God is creator, as I said there, and he's worthy of worship. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. He's worthy of that worship. What I'd like you to do this morning is turn your Bibles to another passage, 2 Peter. We're going to turn to 2 Peter, um, verse, uh, chapter 1. And Peter here is approaching death. And he's saying some things to, to the people around him. In, in verse 12 and 13, it says this. He says, For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of the things that you know and are established in the present truth. There's that, there's that, there's that phrase again. Yes, I think it's right, as long as I am with you in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. So why are we going over Revelation 14 this morning? Because most of us have heard this before. I think it's because, I know it's because we need to be reminded of things. Every generation needs to be reminded. Every generation has a present truth or something that's relevant for the time in which they live. And so we don't just want to live our lives out and mark the check boxes. We want to live with intentionality and with purpose in what we do, believing and knowing and trusting that God has a mission for us. God has something for us to do, not just be pew warmers. You, right? And so when, when I think about this, I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded of things pretty often. She's smiling under the mask. When I walk in the house after working outside and I have my boots on and I walk into the kitchen and I get the water, my wife goes, your shoes? Oh yeah, thanks, thanks for reminding me, honey. I'll take my shoes off again for the 1,500th time in our house, right? The other day, the other day I, I went to Amazon to order some supplies and I made my ch- ch- checks on the, on the, on the list um, my shopping cart, and, and I processed it, and I, and I left, and two days later, I went out to my front door when I got home that evening, and I, and I look out on the porch, and there's no boxes, and you know what happens when that happens, right? Your heart just thinks, you go, why didn't they come? Where's my stuff? So the next day, they didn't come again, so I went back to Amazon, and I looked at Amazon, and I thought, where are those things? Because they tell you when they're going to be there, you know, and I didn't remember to press the purchase button, in the cart. I mean, here's, here's my point. If we have a hard time remembering to take off our shoes, take out the trash, click purchase, you name it, we ought to think considerably more about the important things that we need to continually remember. Amen? There are some biblical truths and some biblical things that we have to spend some time remembering. 
We all need that gentle reminder, and here's the thing I want to praise God for this morning. I'm so glad that God is patient with us, aren't you? I'm so glad that God is patient with us. One of the things that we need to be reminded about, and I mentioned it several times now, is this idea of present truth. Um, something that's relevant, something that, that is impactful for the generation in which we live. And one of the things um, that I wanted to bring up is that in early Christianity, there was this, there was this idea uh, called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism was this idea of these people that had this secret knowledge that not everybody else had. In other words, if you put together certain texts or certain codes, you would come up with this secret idea in which this small group would, would have. And there's actually today, you can go to the bookstore or Amazon, you can find several books on this. People make a lot of money on putting codes together and trying to make this, this whole biblical thing. It, it, it's a secret, and you gotta, you gotta, you gotta figure that out. Um, but the reality is this morning, I'm getting spam calls. The reality is this morning is that that is far-fetched. It's not true. Because the Bible is clear. The Bible is understandable. And when we go to study the Bible, the Spirit of God helps us better understand what it is we're studying. Amen? There's no secret code. There's no, there's no hidden agenda. God makes it plain and God makes it clear for people that want to open the book and study it. Every generation has a special purpose, and that's what the idea of present truth is. It, 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 we could go more into detail of that, but that's not what I'm focusing on this morning. Right here in, in, in Peter, and my pages are wrestling with the wind. I don't have that problem inside. Um, right here in, 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 in Peter, um, we're reminded again a couple of verses later that we've... That we've um, not been following cleverly devised stories or fables, but we're actually eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then in verse 19, in verse 19 in chapter 1, he says this. He says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in dark places until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing the, that first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. There it is right there. So, again, we have something that's reliable, his word. We have something that's prophetic, this message. And we have something to look forward to, the second coming of Jesus, according to this message. One thing that you've probably heard, maybe you haven't heard, is that we have, uh, I think it's in, in a hymn, um, we have this, we, we look forward to the blessed hope to come. Have you heard that before? We look forward to the blessed hope to come. Uh, the end time focus is um, something that we, uh, <clears throat> we, we take seriously as Seventh-day Adventists. We have whole seminars on it. You can go to them online. There's currently many of them going on right now all over the world because of the state of the world in which it's in. And so we say, hey, we have great answers for a lot of your big questions um, that deal with prophecy. Um, but, you know... Um, we love to study it, we love to investigate it, and we love to know it. But the end time focus is this. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. In Revelation 1-7, if you turn there, Revelation 1-7, I don't know if you guys can turn off all the other mics. Revelation 1-7, says this, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. There it is. It's, it's clear. It's concise. It's not confusing. It's not a secret. You know, here, here's the thing. All the texts that we're, we've looked at this morning, most of the texts, the big ones, um, have talked about the second coming of Jesus, that he is coming again. And here's the thing. Jesus, Jesus is coming again the way the Jews thought Jesus should have come the first time. 
Think about that. The Jews, when you, when you look at history, the Jews believed that the Messiah would come as a messianic king to put his rod down and his flags up and say, I'm here, everybody's good now. That's what the Jews believed, that he was coming to conquer and to set up a kingdom. But Jesus didn't come that way the first time. Jesus came as a Messiah to die for us, amen, to, to take our sins upon him and to be put to death and to be raised again to go up to heaven to prepare a place for us so that when he comes again, he can put his flags down and say, this is my kingdom. You are my people. That's what the second coming is about, is God to come establish his kingdom here with us, his people. You know, for a lot of people, a revelation uh, can, can, be, can, can give you a little anxiety. You can get a little nervous when you read the revelation because you read through it and you, you read about, uh, uh, for instances, you read about the time of trouble, right? You read it and you go, oh, I need something to lean against right here because <laughs> uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty graphic in there. I'm, I'm, I'm glad this post is here. But here's the thing. One of the instrumental founders in the Seventh Adventist Church, in the Seventh Adventist movement, wrote long ago regarding the end of time, that's not to be our preoccupation. We're not supposed to worry about that. I'm paraphrasing here, and they said, we need to focus on lifting up Jesus and making sure people see clearly who God is. Because as we look at the three angels' message, which I read there, we're going to get into it in a minute. You see that there's, there's a lot of confusion with that second angel. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city. She has made all nations, all nations, all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Jesus is our blessed hope. Amen? Amen. Not our blessed fear. Going back to Revelation 14, these three angels, um, like I said, when the, this movement began, about intense Bible study and, and a look at the second coming of Jesus, the, the, the people saw themselves proclaiming the good news that Jesus was about to return and that the everlasting gospel of this first angel's message was important and urgent. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for thy harvest is ripe. In other words, the earth, the people are ready to hear this message about who God is because there's been so much confusion. Then you have the second angel's message, which talks about how Babylon has fallen, and you can see how other churches oppose this message. And Babylon, in simple terms, meaning confusion or a counterfeit, false system, a false system of worship. You heard in that text that worship was mentioned several times. Worship to God at the beginning, but worship to something else or someone else later on in that passage. Then there's the third angel, which goes forth again, talking about the two groups that worship. And here is the vivid detail and the symbolism of Revelation 14. And I think a lot of people miss out on the essential plan at the beginning. All of this, this whole scope of the three angels' message is framed in the context of you ready for this? The everlasting gospel. It's all framed in that. It all goes, that's the center point for looking at these messages, is the everlasting gospel. False system worship, what's the everlasting gospel? All these different ideas, what's the everlasting gospel? The mark, what's the everlasting gospel? What's, what's that mean? You know, in that passage that I read, I talked about, it talked about from Revelation 14, that we're to fear God and give glory to him, reverence to him, right? Let's turn in our Bibles to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, back in the Old Testament, somewhere here, oh, there it is, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, 13 and 14. 
And here's what it says. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. We've talked about that this this past quarter in our quarterlies, and that's where I'm getting this from in that Sabbath School quarterly, which, by the way, if you don't have one, talk to Oscar, as Erica mentioned. Um, the next one's on education. But um, we, 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 we discussed this idea uh, uh, several times that here's the reality. There is going to be a judgment, right? And I don't say that with, with, a, with, with a, you know, like, yay, there's going to be a judgment. But God has given us a way out. Amen. There we go. For our sins to be wiped away, to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. God's given us a way out. But we also have a choice not to have Jesus in our lives. And our sins are like scarlet, and they could stay like scarlet. Revelation 14 is reminding us not only to give God our sinful nature, but give God our worship. Give God our everything so that when you do this out of love, you will keep his commandments, you'll follow him, and you'll be ready. You know, there's this idea that the end of time, at the end of time, that God's people will have a special message that they're passionate about, and it's true. But it's also a warning message because God wants us to be ready, right? God wants us to be ready to be ready. It's kind of like if when I was in school and I would have a Greek test, the, the professor would, would say, okay, here's what's going to be on your Greek test. You need to study for it because the examination in two weeks is going to be very difficult. And if you don't pass it, you have to retake this class. And that's like, you don't want to do that with Greek. But here's the thing. The professor gave us the warning. He gave us the material. It was our choice whether we wanted to study it or not. And many of us did, and there was maybe one or two that didn't, and they didn't finish their degree. God gives us a warning. God gives us the material. He says, hey, this is what you need. Amen? This is your choice whether you you do this or not. And I, I think that a lot of what this has to do with is people's picture of God, who God is. Is God some kind of harsh vindictive, condemning figure, which many people have that view of God, by the way. And nothing could be further from the truth because the truth is we have a loving Father in heaven that doesn't want anyone to perish. Amen? Amen. We have a loving Father in heaven that doesn't want anyone to perish. But some people say, yeah, 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 I've heard that, but there's still going to be a judgment. Yes, at the end of time, when the judgment takes place, it's not that God wants to finally do this and, and you know, have this happen. It's that God doesn't force us into go one way or the other. God is not going to push us into the corner and say, follow after me. God wants to say, hey, it's totally your choice. That's the risk I'm taking. It's your choice. In the end, some will choose sin and selfishness instead of what God has to offer. And you know what? That will be tragic. Which is why God wants you and me to be instrumental in the spreading of the everlasting gospel. Because the everlasting gospel is a clear picture of who God is and how much God loves his people. You know, we like to look at the three angels' message and wonder when are the angels going to shout this out? When are they going to when are they going to go around and say all this? These three angels, Josh, Pastor. You know when I was in um Texas there was a guy that was coming to a a seminar um that we had and and we were one of the nights the speaker was going over the three angels message and he came and he said, "When when is this going to happen? When are these angels going to go out and and say these things?" And the the pastor said, "Hey, come back next week." and I'll let you know. You'll know next week. And the guy came back the next week, and the pastor talked about this three angels message again, and he said, you are the messengers. And the guy, afterwards, he came and he said, I'm the messenger? He says, yes, the angels 
fly around and go with you too, but you are the messenger for God. You're the one who's going to go out and tell people who God is, give people that warning, and call them back to worship him. We are the proclaimers to go out to save as many people as possible with God's help. You know, this, this week as I have studied this passage, it's reminded me once again that, that in the world, with all its trials and tribulations, the things that we see, that there's a lot of false ideas, misconceptions that are skewed about who God is, about what he's going to do. I mean, you can, you, I, I've, I've gone on YouTube in the past month and I've typed in certain things and looked things up and I, and I have to take my glasses off and stop and hit the pause button and go, Lord, some of these, some of these even evangelists are, are, are so off and so condemning and, and so angry. You know, the, the things that are said it almost brings tears to my eyes about who they make God out to be. And so, so people, people watch that and it's no wonder they're mad at, mad at Christians. It's no wonder they look at God and go, well, your made up God is just some crazy guy in the sky who's gonna burn people. But I'm telling you today, we have a message of hope. We 